Good morning, Life Church. Good morning. Good morning. I wonder if we can just stand up and worship Jesus today. God, we love and we adore you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing in our midst, God. God, we welcome you in this presence today, this place today, God. And we ask that you would have your will and your way this morning, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning. Come on. to the house of the Lord right now. Let them know it's so good to see each and every one of you here. Amen, amen. I truly believe, I truly believe that the Lord wants to come down in this house today. And I believe that God wants to move in a special way. And I truly believe that God wants to touch hearts and lives. You know, we're living in a day that fear is just gripping the hearts of individuals. People don't really know which way's up and which way's down right now. And we're seeing that in every aspect of life. But here's the thing that we've got to have comfort in, that our hope is in Jesus Christ. 
and that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. I want us to pray right now for our service. I also want us to pray for Sister Rhonda. She's going to have hip surgery Monday. And so I want us to remember her. Let's continue to remember Sherry Williams in prayer. She had surgery Friday on her back and has come through and is doing good. Continue to remember Ray Williams in prayer. He had back surgery and is recovering from that. And so let's remember all of them in prayer that God would just come down and touch in a mighty, mighty way. Would you just raise your hands and let's just invite Jesus. Come on, let's just invite Jesus in this house right now. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. God, we know that you're a great and a mighty God. We know that you're a powerful God. You're a wonderful God. And Lord, we can't do this on our own talent, on our own ability, or by ourselves. But God, we need you this morning. We need you to breathe over this church. Breathe over this auditorium. Breathe over our hearts. Breathe over our lives, God. Oh, we need you, Lord. We need you today, God. Heal the brokenhearted. Minister to those that are down and out. Touch those, oh God, that are living in a state of fear. For your word says you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. I pray right now. Move, I ask, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Would you give the Lord just a great big hand clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, clap your hands under here right now. Today we're going to give you a wonderful opportunity and that's to give of your tithes and give of your offerings today. I'm so glad that God has been so good to all of us and God has blessed us with jobs and God has blessed us with incomes and he has blessed us with being able to give and I'm just so thankful for that. And so what we're going to do today is our legacy offering. And I'm sure that all of you got our text asking because, of course, there are those that uh, are not coming. And there are those that are, are still at home. We've got those that are in quarantine. Uh, and, and so there's just a variety of things that are going on. But you know and I know bills still happen, right? And so we're going to ask you just to help us out. If you that are watching by the way of live feed, uh, if you would like to join in, you can text to 84321 or you can go to our app and give there. We would love to have uh, all of you to participate in that because you sure don't mind sitting there watching our service. Uh, and so why don't we just give uh, as the Lord has given unto us uh, because God has definitely blessed us. Uh, and so I'm going to pray again, and I'm going to pray over our tithes and our offerings. I already put mine in. And so, but would you raise your offering? Would you raise your tithe right now? God, we want to say thank you. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for our income. Thank you, God, that you have supplied the need in our home. Now, God, we want to just simply give back to you uh, what you have given unto us. Uh, we want to give to you with a cheerful heart. Uh, we want to give to you with a heart of praise today uh, because that's what you ask of us. Uh, and that's what we will do today. Uh, we love you, we adore you, uh, and we magnify you today. Uh, in Jesus' name, uh, amen. Uh, would you come out the right side uh, and would you go back in through the left? Let's bring up our tithes uh, and our offerings unto the Lord. Because my heart is full and my soul is free and my
you know, sing it with us. We may have died. your voice is saying, say, so we lift our hands, Lord. We worship. We worship. Say forever, my Savior.
that in your spirit this morning say
today. He is certainly worthy. I said he's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of all of our worship. Come on, would you just magnify him right now? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I wonder if you would just raise your hands all over this house. And would you just lift your voice unto him right now? Would you just magnify him right now? Oh, you're worthy, God. You're wonderful, God. You're mighty, God. You're magnificent, Lord. You're powerful, God. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I am so thankful for the beautiful, the beautiful presence of the Lord that's in this house. I'm so glad that Jesus has walked into this place today. I'm so thankful that he has come to receive our praise and to receive our worship this morning. Thank you, Lord. Would you just thank him for receiving your praise? Thank you for receiving your worship today. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Brother David McKimmy is coming at this time, and he is going to bring us the word of the Lord this morning. I know that he has heard from God, and I'm so glad that he is here with us today. Come on, brother. Hallelujah. What a beautiful presence of God we have experienced here. This morning, and I know you just sat down, um, but if I could impose on you for just a moment to stand with me again, book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, 1 Samuel, chapter 16, praise God, I love coming here, I, uh, to Texas, I don't know, six, seven years ago, and my GPS, I never changed it, and not that I don't know the way, I just like to know how many more miles, so when I come back here, I just push home, and it brings me here, so uh, I guess that means I'm home. So it's good to be home. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 11. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. I want you to remember now, back in those days, they didn't use um, they didn't use just a little bottle of oil, you know, and just kind of like brill cream, a little dab will do. No, no. When you got anointed, you knew you were anointed. They took that horn of oil and they poured it over your head and it started dripping down through your hair and into your beard and into your clothes. And everybody around you knew you were anointed. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Now this is the part right here. 
and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, watch this, from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. I want to preach this morning, your promise is bigger than your problem. So before you leave here this morning, I want you to think about, I want you to think differently about your problem. Before you leave here, I intend on having you say problem, meet promise. Problem, you're going down. We got a world full of promise, or we have a world full of problems, but we got a book full of promises. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Jesus, I need you this morning. I need your touch. I need your ministry. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I cannot do this by myself. I need you, God. I need you to step in here and touch me. God, I need you to touch this congregation in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I've always tried to somewhat stay away from this story because when I was a young evangelist, um, on the field. Now, there were three that would work in any situation, and this was one of them. This one, and of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if those two didn't work, that's back when you went every night so you could try them all out. Then you could throw a little bit of Daniel in there and if they weren't moved by the time you got done with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you felt like you were in the lion's den. And there was always, I don't know how, how it worked this way, but when you were trying to preach, and notice I said trying to preach, and it just wasn't happening, there was always a, Bless him, Lord, lady in the congregation. And if you don't know what that is, it's a little old lady that when she saw you were struggling, she'd say, Bless him, Lord, bless him, Lord. So I've always stayed away from this, even though David is one of my favorite subjects to study. But I found something in here that I just absolutely could not resist preaching. Now you have to understand, David was shepherd boy, he was the youngest. And his father didn't have a whole lot of confidence in him. And so his father even tried to, there's nothing like trying to manipulate God. And just in case you ever thought about it, let me just tell you, don't even try. But Jesse thought he would just bring out his other children and leave David out in the field because he reasoned in his mind, surely the prophet would not pick him. And that's when Samuel, not even knowing how many kids there were, he said, is this all of them? And when he found out that it wasn't, he said, I, we're not even going to sit down till that youngest one gets here. And when he got there, the voice of the Lord spoke to Sam, Samuel. He didn't have to interview anybody. He didn't have to uh, walk around and, and talk. He didn't have to ask Dad which one he thought. The Lord spoke to Samuel and said, for this is he. Now, that doesn't sound like a maybe. That doesn't sound like a 
possibility? That sounds pretty absolute to me. But when he pulled that horn of oil out and poured it over his head, he made it official. And God came down and anointed him. The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Now, let me skip ahead. That's 1 Samuel 16. Let me go on into the next chapter because that's where all the stuff that everybody's used to hearing about happened. David shows up to bring his brothers some bread and cheese and fruit. And when he gets there, they're having a little bit of a standoff. Now, let me, let me just say this. After studying this somewhat, I, I, I learned that it really wasn't uncommon when two armies came together to reason it out and say, you know what, if we do this head-on thing, we're going to kill a whole bunch of yours. You're going to kill a whole bunch of ours. We're, you know, even if we win, we're going to lose. So how about you pick the best you got, and we'll pick the best we got. Let them duke it all out. Winner takes all. So that, that's kind of how they did it. Now, what was not normal is for one of them to be a little over nine foot tall. That was the abnormal part. Now, a lot of people, when they look at this story of, of David and Goliath, they think, man, that, that dude was big. He was big. But when you start reading about his brothers, Goliath was the youngest and the shortest. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how tall all of them were, but that oldest, his bed was 13 foot long. So that just kind of, yeah. Yeah, so he, you know, he got shorty of the bunch. But still, nine foot tall, and he comes out challenging the army of Israel. Now, there wasn't a sane man in that army that thought for one minute they were any match for Goliath. But when David heard this, when David heard, I guess they call it talking smack. When, when Goliath and talking smack is when you come out there and start just, just really rubbing it in what they're going to do to you. I'll feed your flesh to the, to the fowl of the air, that, that kind of stuff. That's talking smack. When he, started, when he started saying things about God, David heard that. And he's like, he's never been slapped just right. If he ever had been, he'd never say what he'd say. Isn't one of y'all going to jump out there and take him? And they're like, uh, have you stopped to take a look how big he is? So finally, David just come on out. I don't think David ever intended to take him on. David was trying to convince them why they should take him on. And so he starts talking about a bear and, and a lion. Actually, it was a lion, then a bear. But he starts telling them about this. Now, this was a very interesting story because the Bible said that they went to the king and they rehearsed it. Now, I realize there's a lot in translation there, but they, they, they begin to tell the story to Saul like David told it to them. He said, there's this kid here. Man, he said a lion come out, and he killed the lion, and then a bear come out, not the same day, but, you know, different times. 
and he killed the bear. And he said this uncircumcised Philistine. Notice he didn't call him a giant. He didn't say how tall he was. He didn't say that big boy. In fact, he called him something kind of not nice. And, and he said, he will be no different. Now, I know you're wondering, where am I going with this? I took a text in one spot, now I'm all the way to the next chapter. Let me just say this. David, how, how was it that David fought the lion? See, everybody wants to know how it was that he took on Goliath. No, no, you, you can't start there. You've got to start with the lion. So how is it that David went after the lion? I don't know of anybody that I've ever met that would go after a lion. But keep something in mind. David already had it in his mind. How can a lion kill me if I've got a promise to be the king when that lion threatened his father's sheep he thought you know what I bet I could just walk down there and grab him by the beard I bet I could just work his motor over and strangle him because he can't kill me because I am already been anointed to be the king. David got a revelation that his promise was bigger than his problem. When he looked at the lion, he saw a problem, but he remembered standing under a tree where the old prophet poured the horn of oil over his head and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. His promise was a whole lot bigger. His promise was a lot bigger than his problem. It had nothing to do with technique. It had nothing to do with strength. It had nothing to do with stature. It had everything to do with promise. So after that battle happened, he had a lot of confidence. I mean, I have to tell you, if I whipped a lion... I'd probably think I could take a bear too. So when the one problem was behind him, and here come a bear, look different, different color, different size, you know, different things to watch out for. He already had the promise. It didn't matter how the problem had changed, how the problem came out different how the problem showed itself in a whole different form. The promise was the same. So what did he do? He kills the bear too. So see, he, he didn't tell. Notice he did not tell those men of Israel the whole thing. I mean, he's smart. Really? You're going to tell the king... By the way, I've been anointed to be your replacement. You know, things didn't go well for him with that king anyway. And, and the king had even offered his daughter's hand in marriage to the man that could kill Goliath. I think David got ripped off on that deal. But it was all about the promise. It had nothing to do with the strength. So when, now here's the ironic thing. David said something to the king that made him believe he could pull it off. The reason why I say that, you know, I've heard people say, well, he was just a scrawny little old boy and everybody knew he was going to get killed. Well, here's the thing. If he did get killed, then they would all be servants to the Philistines. So they all had to they all had to buy into this and say, He is our way out. We believe he can pull this off because 
We don't want to be servants to them. So it wasn't a matter of just letting this kid do something crazy. It was something about the way he said it that not only did the men of Israel, except for his brothers. Something about family sometimes. But those men believed he could do it, and then here they got the chain mail. They put it on him. you got to understand, he was not a warrior at this point. He turned into one, but he wasn't at this point. He had never had chain mail on before. Chain mail is, is, a, is a garment made out of metal. And, and the idea of the chain mail is so that the sword doesn't cut you if they hit you with it. And, and they, it doesn't cut you in half, in other words. And, and so, Bible said that when David put it on, he said, I cannot go with these. Watch this. For I have not proved them. Woo. He said, I got to have something. I got to have something I know works. And this right here, this ain't working. He said, this right hand, I got to have it free. I cannot have that chain mail weighing me down. And, and I can't have it all over me because I'm going to be in a, I'm going to be running. I mean, I'm going to be getting it as hard as I can go. Not running from Goliath, but running to Goliath. Now, let me, let me help you understand something about these shepherd boys. These shepherds had hours and hours and hours of nothing to do out in the field. And so they took a sling, and they perfected using that sling. Now, it wasn't a long-range weapon. They were extremely accurate as long as they were within 20 yards. Within 20 yards... Just an average shepherd boy could come, watch this now, within a hair's breadth. Now that's pretty, pretty close. The Bible said that David said, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to prepare some stones. Notice the Bible used the word prepare stones. The reason why is because he didn't just pick stones up. They had to be balanced. They had to be perfectly balanced. And so he took them on another rock and he would scrape those stones and scrape them and scrape them until they were completely balanced. Why is that? For it to accurately hit where he's going to sling it, it had to be completely balanced. Now, there's a lot of question about why he picked up five stones. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's kind of like a six-shooter, except it was only five. That way he had four more left if he missed. No, 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 David knew he wouldn't miss. The reason why I picked up five is because of Goliath's four older brothers. And back in those days, and, and if you'll notice throughout the Scripture, David went and killed them all. You know why he killed them all? He knew they were all after him. So he went and found every one of them and killed them before they found him. That's just kind of how it worked back in those days. So David wasn't scared. He was ready for the whole family. He was ready to, I mean, batter up. He was ready to do it. Now there was just a little gap that was in that, that helmet, and it was right here at the nose. It was only about that, that wide right there. It was the only spot David was going to have. He knew hitting him in the head wasn't going to do any good because he had a helmet on. But if he could get that stone right there through that gap, that little tiny gap, he'd take him out. When David went running to him, he was just getting within the 20-yard range. He was outside the range of Saul's spear, but he would be within the range of his sling. 
What I'm preaching to you this morning is David didn't use anything outside of what he was used to using. He was counting on the fact that he had been anointed king, that his promise was on top of him, that God's anointing was on him, and nobody else would deal with this problem, and he decided, I'm going to take care of this problem myself. I'm here to tell you, David's promise was bigger than Goliath, the problem. Now we're living, I've seen so many posts about 2020. Oh man. Hey, what makes you think New Year's Eve is going to be a wonderful day when it turns 2021? People just hate this year because everything about it has been terrible as far as, as, far as um, this virus and uh, everything else has happened. Well, it's generated problems. There, there's people that's lost their jobs. There's businesses that have gone under. I, I just noticed yesterday how many businesses have closed in Nacogdoches. Uh, shops, stores that are no longer there. They've, they've emptied out. All because of this whole economic problem that this virus has caused. And I, and I know many of you sitting here today have had downline stuff that's happened to you because of those things. It kind of, it affects everything and affects everybody. What I'm here today to do, I'm here to breathe hope into your sails. I preached on hope the other night, but I'm here to tell you, I'm addressing your problem now. I'm just going to tell you right out, flat out, your problem is not big enough to take you out. Your problem is not big enough to defeat you. Your problem is not big enough to bury you because your promise is a whole lot bigger. It's a whole lot bigger than your problem. I don't care how bad the finances are. I don't care how bad the unemployment is. I don't care how bad all of that is. I'm here to tell you God is going to work it out. God is going to take care of you. God is not going to let you want. God is not going to fail you. He is not going to turn his back on you. He is blessing, and he does care about you. He does care about what you're going through. But you got to see it like David saw it. You got to look at it like David saw it and say, <laughs> Oh, it's going to have to be bigger than a lion and a bear. And notice he said, And this uncircumcised Philistine will be no different. Had nothing to do with the size of the problem or how big, bad, mean, or how bad the bread was. Didn't matter. And, and even the smack, the smack talk. And I'm telling you, Goliath, he could talk some smack now. I, I sat on, on a plane a few years ago with um, a guy, he was over eight foot tall. Just a little over, but he was, he was tall. Or seven, maybe seven. Because of 757, the bulkhead is seven. That's what it was. It's seven foot, and he had to... He had to do his head like that right there. And he sat on the inside, and he had to fold up kind of like to get him. Anyway, he played for the Detroit Pistons, and he finally says, you don't know who I am, do you? And I said, uh, yeah, I do. He said, who? I said, you're the biggest guy I've ever seen. <laughs> and when he, he told me... Uh, Lam Lambeer, I think, was his name. And uh, I'm not a basketball fan, but he said he, he didn't play anymore. He said, but I was one of the original Detroit bad boys. And I was like, what's that? So he's, you know, telling me about. I asked him, I said, I want to know something. When y'all are out there playing do y'all really talk about each other's mama? <laughs> he said, oh, man. He said, do we? If we really want to get to the other guy, we talk about their wife. 
He said, man, you wouldn't believe the stuff we're saying when we're going to make a layup. He said, you just wouldn't believe the smack we talk. He said, now, when the game's over, we're all friends. We'll go play golf together. We'll go on vacations together. Well, when we're out there on that court, he said, it's business. And he said, we will say anything we can to unnerve whoever's trying to make a shot. I'm here to tell you that that's all the devil is worth right there is talking a bunch of smack. The devil isn't a big enough devil to take you out and to take you down. He's certainly not big enough to cause the plan of God to be aborted. He is not big enough to decide your fate. Hey, you're going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. God is going to take care of you. God is going to see you through. God is going to take care of whatever your need is. Your promise is bigger than your problem. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning? Glory to God. Let's just lift our hands and love him right now. Jesus, I love you, God. I love you, God. I praise you, God. I magnify you, God. Oh, Jesus. I don't know about y'all, but it's just a natural thing to try and, you know, manipulate things sometimes. And a lot of times we try that with God. We're like, you know, God, it would really be cool if you did that by noon Friday. Oh, for your glory. Yeah, hey. You're not fooling him. And, and actually, you're not even getting anywhere with him because he's going to do what he's going to do. And watch this. He's going to use who he wants to use. Now, how would you like to be the one God was anointing? And his dad was like, huh? Your own dad. Him? Are you sure? Did you really hear from God, Samuel? I mean, that's the kind of conversation they had. Hey, God sees things in us <laughs> nobody else can see. God doesn't see who you are and what you are. He sees what you're going to be and what you're going to become. When God buys in, watch this, when God buys in, he did it at Calvary. When he buys in to reaching for you and taking you and looking at your potential, you can't earn your way with God. When he chooses you, that's it. He chooses you. And once, you, once you've got those promises, there's not a devil in hell. Hey, the circumstances can look bad. I have to tell you, that would be very intimidating to have a lion, like, threatening you. But David had a promise that was so much bigger. I'm telling you, everything's going to be all right. God has not forgotten you, and he sure hasn't forgot his promises. Now, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really closing, but several years ago, I was uh, preaching in 
Crowley, Louisiana. And Brother Ewing called and said, I need you to come over here and preach for me on Sunday night. And I said, uh, or on Wednesday night. And I said, we didn't have service Wednesday there. It was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So I, I said, okay. You know, back in the summer, I'd been driving and God showed me something, showed me a rainbow. And there was a double rainbow. It was so big. You could see both sides of the rainbow. I'd never seen anything so pronounced. I'd seen pictures, but I'd never seen one in real life, a double rainbow where you could see both sides of it. And I, it, I literally stopped the car. And you have to understand, I'm not one of those kind of guys that, you know, stops the car to look at something. I don't do it. But I did that day. And I said, God, are you trying to tell me something? And he said, uh, yeah, he said, you tell Merle Ewing, this is my promise to keep my word. I picked up the phone. And I started, he said, I didn't tell you to tell him right now. Okay, set the phone down. Months went on, and finally that night when, when he called and said, I need you to come over and preach for me on Wednesday night, I thought, God, you, and I felt a release. So I left and went early, and I got there, and like many pastors, he was tied up in his office counseling somebody. Then church started, and, and he, he comes out of the office, and I said, Brother Ewing, I need to talk to you. I need, it's going to have to wait, son. we got church, man. We're going to see a move of God. I'm like, yeah, yeah we, we are. But I, I really need to, you see, just tell me after church. So we go out onto the platform, and on the way up, he turns and he says, Now, you're an old veteran evangelist, so I know you can handle what I'm fixing to do. But I'm fixing to have to do something that I really hate to do. And he said, and for most people, it would really dampen the service. And I'm thinking, oh, So we get out on the platform, and after they had worshipped, and he gets up there to the pulpit, and he said, he said, Sister Joan and I have just returned from Houston, from MD Anderson, and they've diagnosed me with cancer. Literally. I mean, you could, there was so much ice on that thing, you could have ice skated. I mean, you talk about just, I mean, the people were like devastated. And uh, he said, but I believe it's going to be all right. Now we got an evangelist here. And he t turned the service over to me. And God said, So I said, Brother Ewing, you know, I thought I had something to preach here, but about 10 minutes ago, <laughs> that went out the window. But I do have something to tell you, and they're just going to get to listen while I tell you. And I told him about the rainbow. I told him a double rainbow. And I stopped and I said, God told me, he said, to tell you that is his promise to keep his word. I said, Brother, you and I don't, I don't know what they told you at MD Anderson. I don't know what the particulars are. And I don't even know what the promises are. All I know is there's some promises God gave you. And you're not going anywhere until those promises are fulfilled. Man, that place is full. Now, he had to go for treatments. and 
I saw him several months later and I said, how are you, elder? He said, it's tough. I'm not going to lie, it's tough. Big old tears came and he said, but I got his promise. He's going to keep his word. Well, about three months later, he called me. He said, I just got back from M.D. Anderson. They said they can't explain it. They don't know what's happened. But that cancer is gone. They can't find it anywhere. Hey, I'm telling you, quit focusing on the problem and focus on the promise. Here's what I want to do. I'm opening this altar right now. I'm opening this altar. I want to refocus you. Come down here not looking at your problem. Come down here looking at your promise. God, I believe you. I accept it. I accept your word. I accept your promise. I accept what you said you're going to do. I accept that you're going to fulfill Everything that you say you're going to do, I believe you're going to do. Come on, I dare you. Get out of your seat. Say, God, I'm hanging on to my promise. I'm hanging on to it. I'm not letting go of it, God. I'm not going to let go of it. No weapons may be formed, but it won't prosper. For the God I serve knows all the how. 